Good afternoon again. Our next personal perspective speaker is Portia Hall. Portia has been a sickle cell patient of Dr. Rana for over 20 years after being diagnosed at the age of five. Growing up, she learned that battling life issues and sickle cell pain go hand in hand. Her life mantra has become, no pain, no gain. At 25, she is employed as a sickle cell patient advocate at Howard University's pediatric department. Her goal is to become an entrepreneur in the field of fashion design with her company branded as Fancy Candy, also known as Fancy Creations and Events. She looks at sickle cell as a blessing instead of a, a curse because it has made her a walking warrior in life with sickle cell. Please welcome Portia Hall. Hello. Um, I didn't want to give a summary of my pain because I felt like it would be the same thing since I've been experiencing it for 20 years. So instead I gave you a summary of my timeline dealing with pain. Clearly I was born African American. I was born in Ward 8, the poorest ward in our city. I was raised in Southeast Washington, D.C. Private schools wasn't an option, so no quality education was the future for me. My mother had her own personal issues, and my father was incarcerated before my arrival up until I reached the age of six. By the age of five, I was a sister of three and one on the way. So most would say my chances were slim from the beginning. But who would have known at the age of five that my chances would become a lot slimmer? With now being diagnosed with sickle cell disease and now adding a disabling disease to my already long list of future hardships, was all just the beginning of my journey of living with sickle cell disease. From a child, I learned to hide my pain, not just physical, but emotional pain as well. Growing up in a home with four other siblings, I never wanted to be outcast from the rest and didn't want the sympathy attention. So I played through, laughed through, and went through the pain, only to not feel as if I was any different from the rest. But as growing older, the pain was, wasn't as easy to hide, and, and hiding it only began to hinder me more. I tried to live a normal life when the reality was that I was far from it, and that made my life harder. High school is when my grades started dropping and physical activities like dance and chilling was harder for me than the other girls. But yet, I still continue to hide it. Now I'm approaching college, I'm still on a mission to be normal. I picked the coldest college to attend, which was Frostburg State University. The cold weather caused frequent pain episodes, and I now had to drop out my first year because of too many absences. Faced with going from school to school, only left me feeling lost and in more depth. So I decided to follow my brother's career of getting my certification to be a pharmacy technician. Now as a certified technician, I'm in a fast-paced work environment and constantly long hours on my feet. I love the career and my job, but hated that I left work in pain every day. But I dealt with it because I felt like I had no choice. I was offered a higher pay and better work environment at a new pharmacy that I was excited about. But my new pharmacist didn't understand my frequent breaks, ER visits, and sick days, and stigmatized me often and accused me of lying and also suspended me for a week. Feeling mistreated, embarrassed, sick, and un uncomfortable caused stress and depression, which also caused me to quit. Now I'm even more lost and with still no money to go back to school to live out my dream as a counselor. I took some time off and continued back working with my summer intern as, youth, as a youth supervisor for DC Summer Works. Then my life took a big change when my grandmother, who supported me the most financially, and replaced my abandoned father, which was also her son, suddenly had an aneurysm and was in a coma here at Howard University for two months. On the last day of my intern, on that August day, is when I got the news that she passed away. Devastated loss and now without a job, once again, I channeled my energy and pain and started into creating a nonprofit for the youth. It was called Toys, Teaching Our Young Society. Through that stressful time, I was having frequent more pain crisis due to stress and, and remember stress. 
I remember seeing Dr. Rana as I was visiting my grandmother in ICU, only finding out from him that I didn't have to transition quite yet at the age of 22. So I decided to make an appointment, hoping to get something for the grief and pain I was having. During that visit is when we discussed my nonprofit that I had structured by myself, but with no funds. At the time, he was starting his nonprofit, Life for Sick of Cell, and although he had funds, he lacked structure. So he asked me to volunteer, and now, almost three years later, is why I stand here proud today as a sick of cell patient advocate for the pediatric department. Who would have known that being diagnosed with sick of cell would be a gift and not a curse? Who would have known that my doctor would empower me to change lives? Who would have known that the very hospital I spent days and nights praying for a miracle would be my home away from home? The same creator who blessed me with this internal pain is the same one who helped me gain from my pain. So as you may sympathize with me like others, know that I thank God daily for this beautiful pain because through that I have gained. In closing, I wrote a poem for not only me, but the ones facing pain building and the remembrance of our sick cell warriors who are now in heaven pain free. The title of my poem is called No Pain, No Gain. Pain, pain, go away, come again some other day. It's when my body and mind sings and scream out loud. As the cruciation pain steps me up today. As if today's pain was not like yesterday's. And if yesterday's pain was not like any other day. But I ask myself, would I have it any other way? Because I see as only a way that God has formed me to be strong. As I lay and pray away. Not just for me, but as I pave away for my patience to be brave. And stand tall for the ones that's gone like yesterday. See, I stand tall for not just me, but we. Even with this pain and throbbing knee. Because just like my patients, Christopher, Joshua, Nicholas, and Janet Lee, I know one day like them I will be pain-free while waiting patiently because only God knows my destiny. So as the blood sickles through my veins and tries to convey my brain, I run for the pain, capture the pain, and then embrace the pain. Because I remember the words my grandmother once said, know your pain and through that you will gain. Because there's no pain without gain, so no pain, no gain. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Ball, and I'm a grant administrator here at Howard University. Our next speaker is Dr. Joseph Fry, and he is the department head for the pediatrics and child health here at Howard University. He's board certified in pediatrics emergency medicine and previously worked at Children's National Medical Center. In addition to his medical degree, he also earned a master's of public health. Dr. Wright is nationally renowned for his advocacy, public policy, and research endeavors. His scholarly interests include pre-hospital pediatrics, youth violence prevention, and the needs of underserved communities, areas in which he has contributed to over 80 publications. Recognized as an effective advocate throughout his career, Dr. Wright has received numerous awards, including the Distinguished Service Award from the American Academy of Pediatrics, Section on Emergency Medicine. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Joseph Wright. Thank you. Another hard act to follow. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, um, um, this is my first role in B. Scott, not in attendance, I want to make that clear. Uh, so for, for many years, um, uh, we were delighted to be able to have this as a resource here in the city for uh, those of us who, um, who uh, very much care about the legacy and the issues that Dr. Scott brought to the fore and that this department that I am now uh, so proud to lead have uh, been uh, advocates for for many years and uh, I'm going to uh, flip the script a little bit here and and focus on acute pain management as you've heard my background is in uh, emergency medicine I have um, let me find the mouse hold on okay so I, I have no conflicts to declare um, I do uh, however need to share with you uh, what frames my perspective on this issue. Um, I am a, uh, 
a longtime grantee of the American Medical Services for Children's program, which is uh, focused on evidence-based approaches to the care of children. And in fact, um, I very much ascribe to the mantra that uh, if you do right by the children, it, it helps everyone. So a rising tide floats all boats. So I firmly believe that um, our work, as I think you'll see uh, at the end of the presentation, is helpful for everyone. I am a sitting member of the uh, Committee on Pediatric Emergency Medicine and uh, served for 17 years before arriving here at Howard as the Pediatric Medical Director within the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems, MIMS. Now remember that acronym, it's very important in terms of the story that I'm going to tell very quickly here. So at the end of the session, I want everyone to recognize the value of evidence-based guideline development. And not just with regard to this issue, but in all we do. So much of, uh, of medicine is in fact an art, but that art has to be framed within an evidence-driven um, chassis. So. Uh, and then I'd also want to be able to share with you where you can go to be advocates for your family, your patients with regard to acute pain management uh, and make sure that it is focused on, on, on the patient and the patient outcome. So oligoanalgesia, the undertreatment, ineffectual treatment or lack of treatment of acute pain the underuse of analgesics in the face of valid indications. This is common practice in the emergency care world, and particularly in the EMS world. And part of the reason is the culture, is the practice culture. It is a paramilitaristic culture, which in the context of this issue is, is helpful, is useful. Um, but much of what is practiced in the emergency care environment, particularly in the pre-hospital environment, is extrapolated from other care environments. Uh, you simply cannot say, because this is the way it's done in the emergency department, is the way that it needs to be managed on the street. And there are many examples of where that, um, um, that, that, that kind of logic has proven wrong. And this is a culture where there is a resistance to change. And I think we all can uh, relate to cultures like that. So how has this milieu impacted the issue of acute pain management? Well, there has been, particularly in children, a resistance to weight-based dosing, to giving enough medication to uh, impact the issue. Uh, you have a patient in pain. Uh, there is unjustified concern uh, with regard to the impact of pain management on recognition of visceral pain. How many of our, uh, how many of you in the room have ever heard one of our surgeons, I wish Dr. Cornwell was still here, tell you, oh, don't get, don't provide any pain management because we don't want you to to mask. Um, uh, mask any other visceral concerns. I've, uh, I've, that has been the mantra that I've grown up with throughout my career. Um, then there's an anecdotal fear of, of opioid administration and, and concerns about, oh, the patient's going to stop breathing. And, and so, so much of uh, the practice is driven by anecdote and what we have grown up believing. Then there's also, in the EMS world, um, an unrealistic um, uh, fear or blanket, if you will, need for medical consultation. Um, and, and I'll address that in terms of the project that we did here. Uh, the belief is for, for us is that if you're a provider with a patient in pain in front of you, you need to treat the patient. You don't need to call me, um, uh, who may be at home or in the emergency department, wherever I might be, to provide you guidance uh, on what the patient needs. So with that in mind, uh, oh, and, and let me just add that when there are attempts to develop consensus in this particular arena, the GOBSAT method is what is often applied. And for the interest of time, let me just give you the, what the acronym stands for. So the GOBSAT method is good old boys and gals sitting around the table. And there are many areas of medicine in which this is the way that 
consensus that evidence is uh, derived. And as a result, the 2007 Institute of Medicine report on the future of emergency care called expressly expressly as a key recommendation for the convening of a panel with multidisciplinary expertise to develop evidence-based approaches to treatment and care in the field, including for children. So this is the genesis of, and why is this important, obviously, to be able to apply the, the best available scientific knowledge to inform medical decision making so that we aren't flying by the seat of our pants and, and making anecdotal decisions. Um, and, and for the emergency care arena, and particularly the EMS arena, it also provides tremendous opportunity to improve patient outcomes and, and really uh, solidify pre-hospital medicine as, as part of the whole picture. Certainly, patients that we've all taken care of move through that continuum, and there's no reason that they should not receive the same uh, evidence-based care in that arena as in any other part of the continuum. So we utilized a, um, a tool called GRADE. You see what the acronym stands for there, but it's a standardized method for evaluating, summarizing the quality of the evidence and uh, giving strength to a recommendation. And one of the beauties of the GRADE approach is that it is focused on outcomes. It's focused on the patient. It's not simply focused on the strength of the, the, the papers. And those of you who have seen this kind of grading system uh, every five years, for instance, the American Heart Association uh, publishes an update of their approach to emergency cardiac care and grades the evidence based on a system like this. Uh, the grade uh, tool allows us to look at the outcomes and, and look at them in terms of the quality and in terms of the strength of the recommendations that uh, are generated from this review. Uh, it's very labor intensive and the application of the grade tool through an evidence-based guideline model uh, is iterative. So what I'm going to talk about today for pain management is how we have gone through the process where we are and how what we're experiencing based on the development of an evidence-based guideline will inform, will inform improvements in patient care as we move forward. So uh, we were awarded a pilot uh, uh, a grant to perform a pilot study on pain management. Uh, injury is the most typical reason that uh, patients require um, pain management in the field, but certainly um, uh, acute pain management is something that is a, a very standard part of practice in emergency care and EMS. Uh, we were able to seat a, a expert panel to actually implement the grade methodology, again, a very labor-intensive exercise, and partnered with the, an EMS partner agency, MIMS, that's the acronym. Now, one of the beauties of working with the EMS system in the state of Maryland is that it is a statewide system so that the protocols apply no matter where you are in the state of Maryland. So it was an opportunity to really, at a population level, provide an improvement to um, a, a whole cohort of, uh, a whole geography of patients. And, uh, and so we started this pilot in 2010, and let me just quickly move you through what has happened since that time. So this is what the MIMS protocol for pain management looked like in 2010. And what I want to point out to you here, if you look at the dosing uh, for adults, um, uh, this is with acute MI, but the uh, administration of, uh, first of all, there's a single agent system, morphine, uh, was two to five milligrams IV push, dropped down here to pediatric dosing, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, with a maximum dose of five milligrams. How many of you have uh, had the, we're a group of uh, folks who take care of kids, how many of you have had the occasion, even in the last 24 hours, to take care of a, a, a pediatric patient who weighed more than uh, 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 50 kilos? So according to this protocol in um, 
And just five years ago in the state of Maryland, uh, we have a, a max dose here for a pediatric patient, which um, would, would inadequately, in, in, in my opinion and in what the evidence showed, would inadequately pe uh, treat acute pain. Also, um, we noticed that there was a, an attempt to also assess pain, uh, which is very challenging in the acute care environment. Nevertheless, when we developed the evidence-based guideline protocol, we focused, we focused on the need to make some level of assessment and do that in a developmentally responsible fashion. So assessing an, an adult or an adolescent is quite different than assessing a toddler. And so we are now and have been for the last several years uh, training our folks on uh, assessing pain. But most importantly, the most important development that the development of an evidence-based guideline going through the grade methodology uh, revealed was adequate weight-based treatment, weight-based treatment for pain. So here you see the dosing of 0.1 per kilo um, of, of morphine. You see other agents that are also included as best practice, strongly recommended as part of a protocol. When we brought that back to the state of Maryland, while they weren't ready to add an agent other than morphine, they did recognize that uh, for years, this system has been underdosing patients in pain. And so now you see that the dosing um, has been increased to a uh, max of 20 milligrams for a single dose. And down here for a pediatric patient, the same thing. The uh, other um, very important advance is that paramedics do not need medical control consultation to treat the patient in front of them. If there is a patient that they're treating whose pain has not been relieved, then they can administer a second dose based on this protocol. And now this is where the paramilitaristic culture really helps because these providers are very protocol driven. So with this in black and white, this was the next year's protocols after uh, the evidence-based guideline was developed, uh, will follow a much more a responsive approach to pain management and actually providing adequate dosing. We also argued for the um, addition of fentanyl uh, because, of course, for pediatric patients, it's nice to have an agent in the formula that doesn't require the need for intravenous access, which is all that, which can be difficult in the field. And uh, you know, some cultures are not ready for too much change all at one time, but we stuck to it and. Uh, in 2012, we were able, in fact, to want to add this abdominal pain. Abdominal pain was a contraindication for pain management prior to 2012. And because of the application of an evidence-based approach, where we actually did the exhaustive um, literature review in the uh, method that I showed you, uh, we were able to um, have this in 2012 added, and so that uh, our surgical colleagues could, um, you know, feel comfortable that we were doing the right thing by the patient, and and that they could still do their work when the patient got to the emergency department. Um, the evidence-based guideline approach here it is again. We pushed again for an alternate agent for children because fentanyl. Um, as you know, can be administered by IV, also intranasal, uh, for the patient, the pediatric patient for whom uh, there is not IV access. In 2013, we were finally able to get fentanyl added to the formulary. So what I wanted to just share with you was an approach, an approach to overcome dogma, overcome that's the way we've always, always done it, to uh, really utilize uh, evidence to debunk urban myth uh, about pain agents in the field. We've also uh, published this uh, experience. This is actually a, a, an issue uh, that was a supplemental issue that was devoted to several uh, protocols that were developed as part of this project, evidence-based guidelines in EMS. The, um, I want to recognize my colleagues. Uh, two of the papers are focused on pain management. 
um, the evidence-based guideline itself, and then also its implementation, which I've just described to you. Uh, and uh, I was delighted to serve as um, a senior investigator on, on the project and, and want to recognize my, my colleagues in this work. So I think uh, perhaps we have time for just a couple of questions and, and uh, really uh, want to acknowledge from my chair's role the effort that all of the team, the planning committee and uh, Dr. Rana's uh, team has uh, uh, gone the extra yard to make this just such a wonderful program. I wanted to make sure I, I acknowledge that while I was here. Yes? The, the, the question the question was I think you said what was the patients allergic to uh, yeah yeah one of the things that um, we often don't have uh, the advantage to know in the acute care environment is how um, uh, allergies or if the patient has a, a, a particular response to medication so uh, the other thing that is very clear and I should have emphasized is that patients need to be monitored for for any um, uh, negative outcome relative to the administration of, of a pain medication. And this is something that uh, we have to emphasize as well. Simply having a protocol does not absolve the provider from closely monitoring their patients. So thank you for that question. So how many, how many residents in the state of Maryland do we have in the room? Okay, so if you ever have occasion, and I hope not, to have to be treated for a painful condition in the state of Maryland, at least in the, in, the, in the domain of EMS. You need to tell them, I know what your protocols say. <laughs> I know that I am due one milligram per kilogram of morphine, and don't give me this pitlin, uh, you know, two milligrams and expect me to be relieved. Okay, and this is, this is important. We as the citizens, in fact, the state of Maryland is a jurisdiction where um, our uh, motor vehicle registration fees uh, supplement the cost of running the system. And the helicopters flying overhead uh, at no cost to the citizens are, are part of what we uh, pay as taxpayers. So I'm very serious about that. Um, I'm no longer serving in the, in the medical director capacity, but I always encourage uh, those of us as, as, as citizens to, to advocate for, particularly for uh, uh, what we're responsible for supporting. So again, I thank you for your attention and uh, appreciate it.